we are starting our third, third day of lectures and I'm pleasure to present to you Dr. Han Wing. He is a PhD professor and director of Suzhou University Center for Circadian Clock in Suzhou, Jiangsu, China. Han Wang was focused on using zebrafish Daniel Helio as a model organism to study circadian clocks and sleep, especially on circadian roles in sleep homeostasis. His group currently investigates regulatory mechanisms of canonical circadian clock genes in sleep. Thank you, Dr. Han, to participate of our event, and I hope you have a great uh, lecture. Thank you, Monica. Thanks, Monica, for the nice uh, introduction. I also appreciate uh, the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, participate in this uh, uh, webinar uh, to talk about uh, our uh, recent uh, uh, works on uh, circadian rules in uh, ADHD hematopoiesis autophagy and uh, uh, reproduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever you are. I'm uh, uh, happy to talk to you from Suzhou. Uh, the, we're now in the evening time. Uh, I know some of you may be in the morning or afternoon or also evening. So, um, So first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, people in my lab who did the work that uh, uh, I talked to you today, particularly Dr. Zhao uh, Mingzhong, um, uh, Dr. Jian Huang, Dr. Yin Bing Chen, and Dr. Gordon Huang, and Dr. Tao Le Liu. Um, also like uh, uh, thanks our collaborators and also uh, for the zebrafish community who provide the uh, reagents and fish lines, particularly uh, Professor John Postwaite in Oregon and Wim Bielton at the Vanderbilt University, uh, Bruce Streeper at the UC Davis, and uh, uh, Tom Schilling at the um, uh, UC Irvine. I also like to thank the, the, the support from uh, Ministry of Science Technology and China Natural Science Foundation. So, as I all know that uh, I, I think uh, for this audience, I don't need to emphasize that uh, zebrafish is uh, a great model for biomedical research. What, what I'm going to highlight is that uh, zebrafish is a great model to see circadian clock and sleep. I like to point out two traits zebrafish uh, has. First one is that uh, like human, zebrafish is diurnal, uh, which means that uh, uh, they produce uh, uh, more melatonin in the evening. Uh, they display this uh, uh, activity and rest pattern uh, uh, through, throughout the day. And very importantly, uh, zebrafish uh, uh, are light sensitive. Uh, in, in, in that uh, zebrafish cell lines, zebrafish embryo, and zebrafish internal organs can sense light, which display uh, robust circadian rhythmicity. So, uh, like a human mouse and drosophila, zebrafish clockwork uh, uh, share this uh, highly conserved transcription translation feedback loop. Um, uh, as you as you know that uh, a zebrafish genome has been duplicated, so compared with the fly, uh, even human zebrafish has more circadian clock gene copies uh, than those species. In particular, as I'm going to mention later, uh, for example, uh, Drosophila has one per gene, whereas human and mouse has three per gene. Uh, zebrafish has four per genes, and uh, but generally, uh, those circadian uh, clock genes, uh, like uh, B more and clock, um, uh, can um, regulate the downstream gene like uh, per through 
binding the EBOX in the uh, to promote the region. So uh, that uh, uh, this uh, has been demonstrated by the work in my lab and a few labs uh, 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 in the world that uh, Zebrafish regulate circadian clock mainly through transcription translation feedback loop. Uh, like 10 years ago, my group has initiated a program to uh, generate uh, circadian mutants uh, for zebrafish. Um, we uh, took various genetic tools uh, like uh, uh, insertion of metagenes, metagenesis, and particularly recently the Talon and CRISPR Cas9. Uh, now we are, have generated a library zebrafish circadian mutants. We have all these uh, mutants, uh, we have the all mutants for all the known circadian clock gene. We also has generated some uh, tissue-specific knockout and overexpression uh, mutants, a uh, uh, transition line for those some circadian clock genes. Uh, and uh, uh, here's, you may wonder how we can study uh, local motor activity zebrafish. Here's the, uh, the, the machine we're using. Uh, look at here, I hope you can see this, this is regular, like a regular PCR play, 96 wells. On uh, each wheel, we put the fish larvae uh, in this uh, uh, in the whale. Then the fish movement will be recorded by the camera, and uh, uh, then the, we can uh, uh, track and uh, uh, record uh, fish movement real time and uh, in a long time. So using the machine, we examine the, the local motor activities of our circadian mutants. Uh, as you can see here, uh, like uh, the late uh, Greg Kehill shows uh, previously, zebrafish shows uh, strong, robust uh, local motor activity. During the day, they're most active in night into the resting or sleep state. When we knock out one of the clock in clock A, clock 1A, you see this visibility totally abolished. Then we uh, systematically examine the circadian mutants to look at their period, amplitude, and the phase. As you can see here, some mutants has uh, extended a lengthened period, some has a, a shortened period, and uh, some clock gene mutation has elevated amplitude, some has uh, uh, reduced uh, the amplitude. Look at the phase. Interestingly, some clock mutants phase has advanced, and whereas the other mute, circadian mutant, the phase has delayed. So using the library circadian mutants, we have done uh, research in two aspects. The first one is that uh, we examine their circadian rule in zebrafish circadian network. We are finding uh, some conserved uh, circadian function of this gene. Also, we find some novel function of these genes. For example, we are look at the PER2 gene. Traditionally, uh, the, it was thought this is a one of negative elements in circadian pathway to play uh, the repressed role. We able to show as in zebrafish PER2, in addition to their uh, uh, negative uh, regulation, uh, they also can positively regulate downstream genes. And uh, uh, the second aspect is that uh, we examine or investigate uh, these, uh, uh, the circadian clocking in normal uh, physiological metabolism and uh, the role. Also, we look at the, them, the, the role in uh, some diseases. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to tell you uh, the four stories we have been uh, done in recent years. Um, the first one is uh, regarding uh, the circadian role in mood disorder. As you can see here, it has been um, known for a long time that uh, circadian uh, clock contributes to various uh, mood disorder, uh, such as uh, season effect disorder, major depression disorder, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which I'm going to talk to you today, and, as, uh, and others. So. Uh, the story, this story starts with uh, the mutants we, we get, uh, um, which is uh, pro-1b mutants. Look at here, as I mentioned earlier, 
ZipFish genome, because genome-wide duplication, it harbors more copies circadian clock gene than other species. As you can see here, here Drosophila has one per gene, whereas uh, human and the mouse has a per one, per two, per three, three uh, uh, per two uh, per, per genes. But the Tilios genome, particularly Zebrafish, the per one has uh, was duplicate. So per one duplicate into per one A and per one B. Uh, the first story I can tell you is about uh, the analysis per one B mutants. This mutants was uh, collaborated with uh, Wendell Chen at Vanderbilt. Uh, he generated uh, uh, just a long time ago an uh, insert insertion of mutant genesis library or mutant library. We were able and lucky to get uh, uh, this mutation. Uh, it was found that uh, the insertion of this virus, the virus, the virus, the rest of virus was inserted in the first intron for per one B. Uh, apparently, this insertion abolished transcription per one, and this is uh, RT PCR. And also perform the in situ hybridization, uh, compare with uh, this uh, normal fish. Uh, these mutants, uh, you can completely uh, abolish the transcription. We raise antibody, we perform a Western block and uh, antibody staining. Assume here, uh, those uh, uh, the uh, the protein also uh, the expression the protein also disrupted. So apparently. This is the first uh, zebrafish non-mutation. Then we found that uh, zebrafish Pro-1B mutants display strong phenotype. Uh, they have shorter the period, elevate uh, the aptitude and advanced phase. In particular, uh, all the other three proteins are upregulated in Pro-1B mutants, suggesting that uh, Pro-1B is strong repressor in zebrafish uh, uh, network. So what's interesting us is that uh, uh, when we look at the Pro-1B in regular light dark cycle, we're able to see that uh, uh, this larvae uh, compared with the white type, they have much stronger uh, the uh, uh, activity, particularly uh, the, the amplitude is uh, increased by two or three times, uh, not only in a day, also in the night. And uh, this uh, uh, hyperactive phenotype is caused by loss of uh, the Pro-1B as we inject a normal Pro-1B mi microRNA into the uh, embryo. We can rescue this uh, phenotype. You can see this trace, okay? The uh, Zebrafish Pro-1B mutants has uh, moved fast and uh, moved uh, uh, long distance. So, this uh, uh, draws us to, uh, to look at uh, the could be this fish uh, can be uh, used as a model to study ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, one of more disorder I mentioned earlier. Worldwide, we know that uh, the, uh, between uh, three or five percent of children display this uh, ADHD. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, percentage are uh, increased in Suzhou area where I located about uh, like uh, 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 8% when we look at this uh, uh, collaborate with uh, clinicians in the hospital. And uh, the other thing that uh, uh, has been reported that uh, this ADHD not only is a child children uh, problem, almost half of them uh, can uh, uh, display this ADHD uh, in adult stage. Okay, look at here, uh, the famous swimmer, Michael Phipps, uh, openly uh, uh, admit the, he has ADHD. And then clinically, there are three sets of, of uh, behavior that uh, categorize uh, ADHD patients, which is include hyperactivity, uh, physical uh, impulsivity, and inattention. Because the uh, the uh, in the human adult uh, has also, also dis uh, adults display uh, uh, the ADHD syndrome. Uh, we also examined uh, the adult fish, but uh, we know that uh, the in human, a human ADHD 
uh, patients associated with the dysfunctional dopamine system, uh, which is, means the reduced level of dopamine. And uh, ADHD has been uh, regarded as a neurodevelopment disorder, but little evidence is founded. Also, when we look at this issue, we found that uh, indeed the reports show that uh, human ADHD patients display sleep problem, also disrupt the uh, reasonable melatonin production and uh, disrupt the uh, uh, circadian clock expression. Uh, very interesting that one GWAS study identify human poor one as one of candidate genes, but no mechanism, mechanism how the circadian clock contributes ADHD is reported. So, so we, we also examined the adult fish. Unfortunately, this slide cannot show, but uh, anyway, uh, as I show these statistics, adult fish like your uh, uh, larvae, uh, they display uh, this hyperactive activity phenotype, particularly during the daytime. And uh, we also perform another uh, say This is the movie, which fortunately is not a show. We, this is a uh, essay that we call this mirror uh, uh, attack essay. We put the fish in a tank that uh, at one side tank, we have mirror. Uh, fish can see uh, the image. Uh, fish can sense the, the, the image. Uh, in the uh, in in the mirror, but uh, they will not recognize that's the only image. So, uh, zebra fish like many uh, teleos fish will attack this image. Uh, so that uh, as as shown here, compare with the white type. White type also attack the, the image, but the pro and B mutants attack much uh, uh, stronger graphically uh, than. Uh, then the the mute then the white type fish uh, two or three times more uh, attacking time. So uh, we know that ADHD kids uh, has a problem with the learning, and so how this pro one B mutants uh, the these uh, uh, loss of pro one B affect the learning, and memory ability of fish. We perform the third set of experiment. Here, as shown here, we divide fish tank in two half. One half we uh, wrap this with uh, aluminum foil. This is like uh, no light sites. And uh, this fish can freely uh, choose. Normally, a dark fish will choose to this uh, size without light. But uh, in order to uh, test that learning uh, ability, we at this side we put an electrode. We can uh, electroshock this fish. And trained fish learn how to avoid electric shock. Okay. Uh, generally, that uh, uh, make this story short. Okay. Um, that uh, during the late afternoon, uh, that uh, the fish uh, uh, compare uh, with the whiter fish, the the point uh, B mutants take more time to learn avoid uh, electric shock, and then they tend to. Uh, 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 of uh, have, have difficulty to remember this. So apparently this uh, 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 loss of point B also affects uh, the zebra fish learning memory ability, uh, maybe due, due to the hyperactivity, uh, impulsivity uh, uh, behavior. So um, that uh, as it, just I mentioned that during the afternoon that uh, they turn you remain more time to uh, to to learn it and they turn forget uh, quickly. So that normal fish after training will uh, uh, apparently avoid to get into these uh, dark sites, with uh, the uh, point B mutant still uh, even training them. They still go into uh, these dark sites, uh, even there's electric shock there. So. This set of experiment tell us that uh, point B mutants meet the face validity of ADHD, specifically that the cough syndrome of ADHD hyperactivity in, in attention and the impulsivity can be observed in zebra fish. Now, we know that I mentioned earlier in human and in mouse model, the uh, ADHD patients has a reduced level of dopamine. Now, we are uh, uh, measured uh, the uh, dopamine in adult brain and larvae. As shown here, 
in lobbying and brain, P1B has reduced uh, 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 the dopamine. Uh, in human, that uh, not only the dopamine is reduced, but uh, uh, the norepinephrine in E are uh, increased. Uh, this same thing we observed uh, observing zebrafishy also. You can see that uh, the uh, norepinephrine is upregulated in uh, uh, zebrafishy pro B mutants. So physically and uh, physiologically, uh, this zebrafishy mutants mimic uh, the uh, human ADHD patients. Then they will ask a question whether human, the drugs they use to treat human patients can work in, uh, uh, has the effect on zebrafishy pro B mutants. We use two drugs, one is uh, uh, the Ritalin, uh, which is uh, a uh, dopamine transport inhibitor, can transient uh, increase dopamine concentration in cell. Uh, then, and uh, the other is uh, uh, Dipranil, uh, which is a MUE uh, uh, inhibitor that we also, also can increase uh, the dopamine levels. Usage to try to assume here, we use this, uh, we try a few concentrations, add uh, uh, five molar uh, micromolar, which is, has no effect on Y type, but it can uh, significantly rescue this uh, hyperactivity, uh, the phenotype, uh, both drugs. We also did that uh, uh, to try to see if we can rescue this aggressive, impulsive uh, behavior that uh, it does, or the both, uh, the, both drugs, Ritalin and Dipranin, or can rescue the uh, high, uh, the impulsive like behavior. So uh, now this set of experiments show that uh, the point B mutants means the construct validity of ADHD. Specifically, uh, it displays low levels in endogenous, endogenous dopamine and hyperactivity can be wrecked by human ADHD drugs like uh, uh, Ritalin and Dipranil. So what caused the dopamine level reduced? That's the next question we'll ask. So why loss of function, loss of, of problem B can lead to reduced level of dopamine in these mutants? We look at the, the these genes, uh, the enzyme, the genes uh, in dopamine biosynthesis and the dopamine biodegradation pathway. And then we, uh, uh, we uh, focus on two uh, these genes. One is uh, dopamine bad uh, hydroxylases, which is uh, the enzyme convert dopamine to norepinephrine. Uh, the other one is MOA, which is uh, uh, the uh, degrade uh, the uh, dopamine to HVA. Okay, so uh, we examine expression of dopamine in uh, zebrafish, as you show here, which is shows rhythmicity, circadian rhythmicity. And, but in point B is upregulated. We make a transgenic fish that, uh, uh, that uh, Lucifer is driven by point B mutator. Uh, the, uh, driven by point B uh, promoter, you can see here the Lucifer shows the bioluminescence uh, shows uh, a strong rhythmicity. Then we perform the uh, trans, uh, trans, transfection assay, uh, show that uh, uh, in uh, the uh, dopamine promoted the e boxes, which is, can be bound by clock BMO, uh, specifically BMO 1B, clock 1A, uh, that uh, activates this um, uh, activity, promote activity uh, dopamine. And this can be re re repressed by cry uh, 1BA and the poor 1B, particularly. And the BMO 1B protein uh, antibody can bind this e box, uh, assumed here, suggesting that. Uh, uh, DBH is strongly regulated by circadian clock. And same things uh, with the MOA, which is actually reported uh, uh, before by a mouse by uh, uh, um, Irbrex, um, uh group in mouse. Now we show that in zero, which also uh, it shows rhythmicity and, uh, and control by circadian clock. So the story that uh, just uh, uh, because point B uh, can directly control uh, those two genes uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, upregulate this gene because uh, 
uh, loss function of point B upregulate uh, DBH. More dopamine will convert to no norepinephrine and uh, also dopamine can uh, 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 degrade to HVA. So that uh, leads to uh, downregulation of uh, the dopamine. As I mentioned earlier, ADHD is a neurodevelopment uh, disease, but uh, there is very controversial evidence in, zebra, uh, in human because uh, apparently we cannot, uh, it's difficult to examine dopaminergic neuron in human brain. So we can do that in zebrafish. This here's the uh, antibody staining of zebrafish brain. Let's assume here, right type, uh, in white type, dopaminergic neuron show very nice structure. When uh, uh, point B uh, lost, you can see that uh, the number of dopaminergic neurons are reduced. Also, the spatial structure was disrupted, as you hear. So why this uh, loss function of point B can lead to uh, uh, reduced uh, dopaminergic neuron? So that, uh, that's the next question we ask. So the, this set of experiments tell us that uh, to one B mutants needs the uh, predictive validity of ADHD. Okay, Plan B uh, control the dopamine level by directly regulating dopamine uh, degradation gene DBH and more A. Plan B acts through the gene important uh, for development of dopamine a neuron uh, to regulate their number and a special uh, organization, which is shown here. So we look at the, the gene evolving. Uh, the dopamine neuron development differentiation, and uh, which is including uh, WINT uh, and OTA, o OTPA, and MEF. Uh, you will see here, without the point B, all those genes important for dopaminergic neuron uh, development differentiation and maintenance are downregulated. Okay, so here's uh, the summary for uh, this uh, first story. Uh, we uh, using zebrafish mutants point B. We we we, sh we, we demonstrate that uh, it uh, has a, a, a ADHD phenotype. Uh, particularly, uh, not only uh, displays hyperactivity, also the uh, the uh, learning uh, de defects and uh, impulsivity uh, behavior. And the reason is because uh, uh, point B can directly control the uh, DBH and, uh, uh, and the MOA. And also uh, DBH, uh, the PO1B also contribute to the uh, double nodding neuron development stability by controlled wind, MAF, and OTA, uh, OTPA and OTAPB, okay? The second story is about uh, autophagy. Uh, here's, uh, we all know that autophagy is uh, highly conserved intracellular adaptation system. Uh, 2016 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was with all, all, with awarded to uh, Osumi uh, for discovery of uh, the autophage in East. Well, so you, you can see here that uh, in the uh, um, uh, in uh, vertebrates, uh, the autophagy pathway has been elucidated, all these important genes uh, so was a uh, very important uh, uh, factor in autophagy uh, uh, pathway. So uh, when we look at the issue that uh, uh, in uh, 1970s, there is a report show that uh, autophagy uh, activity and uh, vacuum uh, already show these uh, uh, daily changes. In particular, Jianjie uh, Ling uh, lab in uh, the Michigan showing the mouse that uh, the mouse autophagy is controlled by circadian clock, particularly circadian clock, uh, the control of uh, the CEB BP beta, uh, which is a uh, uh, transcription filter. In turn, CB, CEB BP beta controls circadian clock genes. We were wondering how the zebrafish autophagy uh, uh, is regulated by circadian clock. We, I first did um, need a study to show that uh, the number of autophage uh, autofagosome or the autolysome in zebrafish shows daily oscillations, okay, as you can see here, okay. Then uh, 
we look at the the, uh, the key genes assumed in the past the, in the autopsy pathway, or the genes uh, shows the daily changes. Uh, this shows this uh, actually uh, strong resmicity in larvae and also in the liver. Uh, that uh, this is uh, similar to mouse that uh, the the, uh, the autopsy gene uh, shows res uh, circulating resmicity in larvae and adult uh, liver. Then we look at uh, the promoters of this uh, uh, key autophagy gene who are able to, show, to, to observe there is E-box, but also there is IEI, the motif that also regulated by CKD clock. So, so that uh, then the, we examine why uh, the, uh, this uh, CKD clock gene assures resmicity. We we'll use our point B mutants, was shown here in the point B mutants, all this key autophagy gene shows upregulation. So uh, this is actually uh, the uh, uh, it's like um, in, in mouse. We we did that the experiment. We showed that the CB, uh, C uh, CEPP better uh, also controlled by circadian clock. Uh, it's upregulated by uh, the point B mutants. This is. Um, this is promoter analysis, this is cheap, okay? So this is similar to mouse, the zebrafishia, zebrafishia uh, autophage is regulated by uh, circadian count uh, indirectly uh, through uh, CEB beta. But uh, we were wondering if uh, this uh, IE motif also uh, play a role in uh, the autophage. We generate these mutants, uh, real alpha mutants. Uh, you will see this mutation uh, also real alpha also leads to this hyperactivity phenotype in zebrafish. And uh, the most clocked in uh, in this real alpha mutants upregulate particularly uh, that uh, uh, in real alpha mutants, the auto phagosome and auto lysome are upregulated as shown here. So that suggests that uh, Reverba, uh, uh, the this new, uh, this, uh, uh, this circadian clock, uh, the nuclear uh, receptor also play to autophage. And uh, not only this auto lysome and the, uh, the numbers increase, also the key, uh, this autophage gene also upregulated, upregulated in Reverba mutants. Then, uh, similarly, we perform this translation cell report assay. We use one of uh, uh, key genes, OK1A. Uh, there is a, uh, there is a two RE box or ROE box, and uh, uh, this can be bound by uh, Revolva and or, or Ro, Ro Alpha. Uh, that uh, uh, when Revolva bonded to it, uh, they can repress uh, uh, OK. 1A, okay, that's, uh, um, this is also shown by a, a pharma, uh, pharmacological manipulation. We use uh, uh, the uh, real about uh, this uh, um, inhibitor. We show that uh, uh, the same thing with the loss of real bar. So uh, this is a, a second story that uh, we show that in zebrafish that, uh, that uh, uh, circadian clock control autophage through two ways. One is the uh, indirect way, like uh, in mouse, that uh, this zip, uh, circadian clock control the CEB beta. And then CEB beta uh, control the uh, autophage gene and then control autophage. Uh, what do we found? That uh, the real bar can directly control this autophage gene. So the second way, and control the autophagy. So that's just, that's just uh, like uh, we show that in zebrafish, uh, autophagy and autophagy related genes display circadian uh, uh, expression. Autophagy and autophagy related gene uh, uh, display upregulation regulation in reverb mutants. Reverb can directly regulate transcription autophagy gene like uh, ERC1A through IE uh, the elements. Uh, this is the second story. Um, that uh, uh, my third story is uh, uh, 
examine uh, the contribution of circadian clock to the hematopoiesis. Uh, the, first, uh, we look at the one gene called the easy H2, uh, which is uh, uh, belong to the set domain uh, uh, protein family. Uh, it's uh, um, um, uh, normally function to the um, <clears throat> regular the H3K uh, uh, the uh, uh, 20, uh, 27. Okay, so that uh, uh, the easy H2 normally uh, is one of the components of PRC. Uh, they all uh, repress the PRC2 uh, to repress uh, or silence the, uh, the, the downstream gene. Uh, so this uh, methyl transfers is activity. Um, but the, the report that in some uh, the cancer, either two uh, will directly bind to the transcription factor. Instead of repress this uh, downstream gene, actually shows the positive regulation. Okay, so there is a part that show that uh, in mouse, ZD2 is required for mouse liver clock uh, using uh, mouse cell line as shown here. But uh, as you know, a mouse knockout ZD2 die, uh, embryonic lethal, so which is prevent from examining ZD2 rule in circadian clock. So with these mutants, uh, we were able to uh, raise the mutants uh, homologous mutants can live about two weeks, uh, at least 10 days. So that uh, so this give us a window opportunity to examine uh, that uh, the their role in a circadian clock. We particularly interesting three questions were address. One is uh, whether ZVOG is ZDH2 regulated by circadian clock. Does ZDH2 play any role in ZVOG circadian clock? And does ZDH2 regulate Hematopoiesis in zebra fish. Here's show the uh, analysis of uh, EZH2 expression in uh, zebra fish larvae. As shown here, they show strong resmicity. Actually, in poor B mutants, you see the most uh, uh, time points is uh, upregulated. And uh, in vivo R mutants, which is uh, also regulated. Uh, we're, in promoter analysis, we we're examining uh, the promoter EZH2, we found that there's box and ROE box was here, which is uh, assumed here that uh, uh, cell reporter assay uh, show that uh, indeed uh, either two are regulated by uh, circadian gauge through E box and through RE box, okay? And uh, BMO one b and the rule of uh, A also combine these uh, uh, motifs, suggesting that uh, zebra fish regulate tightly uh, tightly the EZ2 transcription, okay? So now what this mutation actually is uh, very, is truncation as you assume here, uh, that uh, in the mutation only uh, have seven, 17 amino acids and uh, it's lost all the, uh, uh, the methylation activity. Uh, but uh, the downstream, uh, this two gene indeed is once upgrade down regulated. So if you look at the, uh, those mutants uh, that uh, in the 24 hours, you can barely see uh, the uh, defects, but, uh, uh, but uh, in the uh, um, a few hours later, you can see uh, this uh, uh, twisted tail. And uh, you can see, uh, I show later, the, the blood has problem. So that's why we uh, uh, look at the hematopoiesis. So, Zebra fish GS2 is regulated by circadian clock. Whether they have a role in circadian regulation, we examine the key clock gene in these mutants. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, normally we would expect that upper regulation of clock gene in GS2 mutants. But instead, we uh, see the down regulation uh, that suggests uh, us uh, this is not only in mutants, also in morpholinos. All this key clock gene is down regulated. I suggest that uh, ES2 may uh, uh, has uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, not the normal rule, um, uh, the repressed rule. Uh, maybe uh, they have this uh, posture rule in zebra fish, uh, the circadian clock. So 
And uh, uh, even though this uh, ZH2 mutants can live like uh, 10 or 14 days, but uh, uh, at a seven day, eight day, they cannot move uh, normally. So in order to examine uh, that uh, the circadian uh, locomotor activity, we uh, first uh, we use morphine, you know, to generate the morphins. Secondly, we uh, the generate uh, overexpression uh, 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 transject line uh, use heat promoter. I assume here uh, the emorphins and the overexpression they show that uh, behavior uh, the defects uh, in particular emorphins. Look at here per periods increased with uh, uh, emorphins uh, in overexpression is uh, is shortened. So that suggests that support that uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the ZH2 uh, play a role in zero fifty locomotor rhythmicity. Uh, this is actually expression of ZH2. Uh, the 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 overexpression to the fish line. We look at the gene expression uh, again. Uh, this is a confirmed loss uh, function mutants. Uh, those genes uh, indeed is uh, if we. We all over ES2 leads to upregulation of uh, clock genes. That's uh, 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 support that uh, the positive role of ES2 in zero circadian regulation. Now, uh, how does it work? As I mentioned, uh, uh, that uh, the we perform this uh, call IP uh, show that uh, indeed ES2 can bind to clock B more. Okay, this is a uh, detail. I, not going to uh, uh, in detail because uh, time issue, but just uh, like uh, I mentioned earlier, year two can um, bind to transcription factor play positive role. This is really happening in zero fishy circadian clock. I always look at uh, um, uh, the key amino acids, which is underlying the histone massive transfer activity. We mutate them. Then we look at that. Uh, uh, we mutate this uh, uh, motif of for uh, massive transfer activity that uh, the uh, does not uh, affect is uh, to positive regulation. That means uh, it has to enhance clock BMO transcription activity uh, without uh, PRC, uh, this uh, massive transfer activity as you hear. And uh, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, it has to in, uh, in circadian clock, this is also once again, movie cannot show but uh, uh, the movie showed that uh, zebra fish, ZH mutants show the blood defects. To find out for which gene affected with perform transcription assay, we are able to show that uh, many of these uh, uh, key genes involved in primitive for hematopoiesis and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, show the downregulation, okay, uh, in the mutants. Uh, this is this is uh, this is uh, in situ hybridization show that the marker uh, gene uh, in primitive hematopoiesis is downregulated. Also, we use this transgenic fish to, uh, to show that uh, uh, this this genes also downregulated in this uh, uh, circadian mutants. Not only in primitive uh, uh, hematopoiesis, in deficient hematopoiesis, the key gene in Involving deficient hematopoiesis also downregulated in is shown by in situ hybridization, also transgenic fish. I uh, suggest that uh, EH2 indeed also play a role uh, in the uh, hematopoiesis. How this uh, happened, what's the mechanism? So we look at the, uh, this uh, marker gene, CIMIC B, uh, and uh, uh, and others in the, uh, the gene involving hematopoiesis look at the, the issues uh, once again down regulation. Okay, down regulation. So that uh, so uh, similarly like ZS2 uh, play uh, in circadian clock in zebra hematopoiesis that uh, uh, they also uh, 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 play uh, the positive roles. Uh, the specifically that the ES2 also bind to the clock BMO, then the clock BMO regulate this uh, uh, the marker G like semi B uh, in uh, hematopoiesis. So that's the our uh, my third story that uh, we found uh, unexpectedly uh, in not in the uh, uh, tumor or cancer, 
in Zipovic's Kidding Clark and uh, Himata Poishis, this normal physiology or development process is there to also play the positive role, particularly so bind to the Clark gene, uh, Clark BMO, and uh, the Clark BMO uh, regular EBOS content gene in circadian Clark genes and uh, uh, CIMIC and uh, LCK uh, in Himata Poishis. Okay, so uh, that uh, the zebra free ES2 is controlled by circadian cloud with uh, both EBOX and ROI motif. Uh, ES2 is required for zebra free circadian cloud regulation. ES2 enhances clock function and hemato poiesis, which is independent of histomethyl transfers activity. Okay, my, my final story uh, that has not published yet, we are in process for uh, process trying to publish this results. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the circadian regulation is very uh, common. Um, that um, uh, in particular, uh, not only clock work in the brain, also uh, uh, works almost all the cell in the body. Assume here that uh, uh, all the all the organ or cell uh, has a circadian uh, clock operates. But this is a, there is a story I had mentioned, uh, Paulo Sosoni uh his lab uh, with uh, uh, several uh, talented postdoc then, um, uh, like uh, 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 Nick Ferguson, Dale Whitmore, and uh, Nicole uh, Samankin. Uh, they were funny that uh, uh, there is an exception in vertebrates. The, uh, Polo unfortunately passed away uh, a couple of years ago, uh, but okay, his 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 work showed that uh, first in zebra fish, when they read more, they clone the clock, uh, they examine many uh, expression of clock in many tissues, as shown here in the heart, kidney, liver, and spleen, uh, clock uh, shows uh, strong rhythmicity, uh, but uh, the test is shows uh, uh, non rhythmicity So it's clear that uh, the uh, testis has no clock activity. This is like uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, subsequently, the field circadian lab, like uh, Amida Siegel's lab, has shown that in the rodents, uh, it's a similar phenomena that uh, the clock gene shows no rhythmicity, no oscillation in testis, as shown here. So, uh, this is, has been a uh, uh, main idea that uh, uh, the, uh, the testis is the exception, uh, that, uh, uh, that do not show circadian rhythmicity. And uh, there's hypothesis to show that it may be due to rapid differentiation of germ cells. So uh, when we look at the issue, we look at the issue that maybe uh, we uh, hypothesize that because this is zebrafish smart poesis. You can see testes has so many different type of cells. We're wondering if just a very small portion of this cell shows rhythmicity. So uh, that, that's, uh, uh, we first performed this uh, transcription uh, analysis in uh, the circadian manner. We are uh, examining the zebrafish testes uh, uh, in two days, each day with uh, six points with a four hour interval. We were very exciting to, sh to find that there is uh, like a uh, close to 5% of genes shows rhythmicity, like uh, more than southern genes. Uh, assume here this group gene shows rhythmicity. And this gene particularly, uh, of course, including circadian clock gene, uh, some gene involving test, test, uh, tested uh, function. And particularly one group gene involving retinal acid signaling also shows rhythmicity. This uh, results have led us to re-examine uh, the testing circadian clock. This time we use the, uh, the per uh, uh, three luciferous, which is generated by Greg Kikio, and also per 1B luciferous we generate. We were uh, excited to see that uh, uh, both uh, uh, um, uh, Transgenic fish, uh, this transfish is testis, uh, shows uh, robust uh, the circadian rhythmicity uh, in testis. And also, the personal rhythmicity uh, totally 
a policy in Clark Newton's, uh, Clark Wang and Newton I mentioned earlier. This is consistent with uh, local motor activity also mentioned earlier. Very uh, excitingly, this risk mist can be phase shift. Uh, we use a 10 hour uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, light dark cycle, advanced cycle. We're able to, to assume that this risk mist have 10 hour um, uh, um, uh, shift, suggesting that uh, tested also can sense this uh, light signal. Uh, it, it shows that uh, indeed uh, and the test is has clock, okay? So where this clock? Uh, so now we generate uh, the uh, few uh, clock uh, uh, gene promoter driven the transient fish line, uh, like uh, PER1B and uh, PER2, we are both examining that uh, this gene transient fish that uh, was uh, expressing Sertoli cell, okay? And the expression in mutants are completely abolished, okay? But uh, uh, both PER1 and B and PER2 has expression in the Sertoli cell where the retinal acid synthesis take place. And this is uh, also uh, show that uh, the clock uh, 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 in situ hybridization in the Sertoli cell and also uh, the, the protein, the, this uh, antibody, uh, the protein also expressed in the Sertoli cell. In addition to Sertoli cell, we also were able to examine clock genes, key clock genes examining uh, expression in spinogonia, as shown here, or shown here. So to examine uh, the possible expression or particular rhythmicity of clock gene and the clock record gene in Sertoli cell, uh, we uh, took advantage of the transgenic fish generated by Bruce Draper of UC Davis, uh, the, the uh, GSDF for amateur. Then the, we uh, took a test out, use facts to fax this gene out. And we, it's difficult because uh, the uh, the three months old adult zebra fish tested only contain like two or three percent of cell, so totally cell, very few. Um, then uh, we were able to get this cell and uh, perform in situ hybridization, uh, to perform the RT PCR and the Lumi cycle analysis, which showed that uh, uh, only tested Sertoli cell, the, uh, the PON-D and uh, the one gene involving uh, the uh, retinacid biosynthesis shows rhythmicity. And uh, this non uh, Sertoli cell, no rhythmicity. And all this uh, cell together without uh, just big cell also without, uh, without a rhythmicity. Lumi cycle analysis shows similar uh, results. Only Sertali cell shows post three rhythmicity. Uh, that's, then I think we have got a, a, a you know, resolve this mystery uh, that why testes do not have for uh, the rhythmicity. Now, because only Sertali cell have rhythmicity, and really, which you count only two or three percent. So when you collect the RNA from a whole uh, testis, you mix that uh, the uh, more than ninety-seven percent of uh, cell which do not show rhythmicity potentially swarm the rhythmicity of Sertoli cell. Okay, so why the Sertoli cell uh, has a, 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 what a Sertoli cell clock do in a testis? Uh, we know Sertoli cell is where the retinal acid is synthesized, but uh, also our data shows that the retinal signaling uh, genes also show the uh, display rhythmicity. We get this uh, transjecting line that uh, are in indicator from uh, uh, Tom ceiling and the course of our fish, we were able to show that in testes that uh, uh, the, the RA are enriched in spinogonia and spermato two zones. Okay, was shown here, but in clock one meter, this uh, uh, has been um, uh, disappeared. So, so how the uh, clock uh, uh, con uh, the interact with uh, eye signaling? Was shown here, we're able to show that uh, there is a box in AIDH one A two and uh, one of receptor uh, uh, IRGA, and uh, we perform the cell transfection assay was used clock beam or regulate uh, uh, these two genes and uh, uh, repressed by cry and the beam one b bind this e-box recently 
suggests that high signaling zebra fish is tightly regulated by circadian clock, uh, particularly by Satoli clock. So what, what could be wrong with that uh, clock? So we use our clock along uh, Newton's and uh, use uh, uh, transgenic feature gathered from the zebra fish labs, many labs, uh, okay, like Ching Shui, Zhao Giu as this, uh, 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 this nano uh, transgenic fish and get this antibody from Bros of Vesa and uh, perform HE uh, staining and also the antibody staining in tissue population. Uh, generally, uh, results that all these GMC are reduced in clock one uh, mutants. Also, we also generate the Satoli cell specific clock one mutants. I use uh, uh, one bill change approach, uh, make two transgenic lines, one express guard RNA, one express the Cas9. So in totally a, a specific clock A mutants, we also ex, uh, examine, uh, observe this uh, reduced uh, the uh, germ cell. Not only germ cell reduced, the uh, clock one mutants also uh, has the fertilization uh, defect. Or oh, this is actually show that uh, the sperm count also reduced, uh, and also the sperm uh, the motility also reduced in both whole body clock and knockout no, no and uh, uh, satellite cell specific knockout uh, mutants. So um, we also examine the other important trait of fertilization, which is fertilization. We're able to show that that uh, the uh, uh, the fertilization rates are reducing clock uh, mutant uh, clock uh, whole body uh, the knockout and the start cell specific uh, uh, disruption. And this uh, also uh, in natural crossing and also in vitro fertilization. So without the clock A, uh, particularly without clock A in satellite cell, will also uh, affect the fertilization. So so, so what could be mechanism to, to do this? We are uh, uh, inject uh, uh, retin acids to fish and, uh, and the perform for trans transcription assay, uh, trans transcription assay also this uh, staining. We assume here that uh, uh, inject the, uh, the retin acids to fish can significantly rescue this, uh, uh, the differentiate uh, spinal uh, gonia, I assume here, but uh, for differentiated, this is for undifferentiated spinal gonia as uh, shown by uh, KDA marker. This is a differentiated. The, there's no effect on differential spinogonia, but uh, uh, that's shows. So um, um, that uh, not only affect these germ cells, also uh, that uh, uh, administer the RA also can rescue uh, the fertilization. Only inject uh, this uh, uh, the the this retinase in the midnight. Okay, here. Okay, and also this is will not affect the spawn count, but okay. So. Uh, to find a possible reason, uh, we perform another round of transcription assay uh, to compare the retin acids uh, treated uh, testes with without treated acids. We were able to find two genes which is very interesting. One gene is uh, ZTBG 16A, which is downregulated uh, uh, in this uh, I treated uh, I treated the fish, and the other one is uh, Isumo Isumo one, which is upregulated here treated with. We, we were able to find there is a, a retin acid binding sites in this promoter region, this two gene, perform a cell transfer action assay, which confirmed that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the retin acids can upregulate, upregulate the ISUMO, uh, which is a, a very important gene uh, that uh, uh, facilitated the recognition of uh, uh, the eggs. Uh, the by the sperm, uh, which is uh, and uh, uh, the facility the fusion of sperm and uh, the oocytes, and the ZTBD 16A, which is involved in spinogonia differentiation. Okay, these two genes. Now, lastly, uh, we all know that uh, this uh, circadian uh, misalignment, uh, the temporally disynchronized, uh, this clock also affects. Uh, uh, the the uh, the reproduction like a uh, uh, truck driver or uh, the uh, shift workers, uh, uh, particularly night shift work, they are, are reported has a, 
uh, the low small accounts. To address the issue, we uh, first is uh, we generate a heat shock, uh, uh, heat shock uh, the uh, the uh, driven uh, uh, clock one a over expression line. Okay, now we can using the heat shock they manipulated uh, the clock one expression. Uh, interestingly, uh, when we heat shock this on the early morning or evening, the fish still maintain resmicity, but only altered their period. Okay, so uh, this uh, uh, temporarily uh, 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 desynchronized clock A will not change the resmicity, but only change the, uh, their period and also also the um, 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 uh, phase. Okay, so but how this affect that uh, the uh, spawner gonia differentiation and fertilization? Very interestingly, uh, when we uh, uh, heat shock, not only in the morning or evening, only once, we not affect that uh, the, this is the eye, uh, uh, eye uh, standing. Okay, we are not. Only when we consecutively seven day consecutively heat shock, you know, heat shock them in seven days consecutively, we reserve this uh, effect of reduced uh, spinagonia and I uh, distribution assumed here. And uh, very interestingly, assume here that uh, when we stop or we, we do this seven day heat shock, then we stop uh, the heat shock only after uh, the uh, seven days, there is time recovery, then those uh, uh, germ cell I distribution and the fertilization can be restored, okay? So here's uh, our, our working model uh, for, for this story here that we think that that is such story clock that works in uh, testes uh, that uh, clock uh, uh, regulate uh, I synthesis. Then the I uh, the clock regular I synthesis uh, works in two ways. One is uh, uh, to uh, affect uh, or control the uh, spinagonia differentiation. The other likely through ZTBD 16A, and the other way is uh, uh, through affect uh, isomu and affect fertilization. Okay, so due to time issue, I'm not gonna uh, 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 say uh, a few. Uh, I'm going to say a few words. So hopefully today's uh, talk can convince you that uh, zebrafish is an attractive uh, model for circadian study. And uh, we are using the library circadian mutants. Uh, we have found some uh, interesting function of circadian uh, collecting in zebrafish. Also, we are able to find some novel role of the circadian clock in like uh, hematopoiesis, uh, reproduction, uh, autophage, and HHD, okay? We also conducted the high speed, uh, uh, the uh, mutant, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, drug screen, we use these mutants. Uh, hopefully we can report you some exciting finding uh, in future. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, okay, so uh, my library is, uh, has many uh, position available, postdoc, uh, research associates. Uh, if you're interested, please send me an email. Uh, this is my uh, WeChat. Um, if you can know how used, please uh, scan and then uh, uh, connect me. Thanks for your attention. My lecture is, is done. Thank you, Professor Han, for your uh, perfect presentation. Uh, I hope uh, all what you told us is very, very important and interesting. And uh, we have uh, one question in our chat, if you would like to answer. And after that, I have a uh, one on question to ask you about okay. uh, the circadian clock. So let me find here the question. Uh, Professor Hen, uh, does the circadian cycle influence cancer? Yes, yes, this is a good question. I did not touch upon. Uh, so it's known that, you know, the cancer mainly is uh, uh, the cell differentiate, right? The cell differentiates, uh, that has so many cells. The cell division cycle 
is controlled by circadian clock. Many genes involving cell division cycle are controlled by circadian clock. And uh, like just I mentioned briefly, a circadian misalignment, like uh, the night shift uh, people go into, uh, 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 you know, long distance uh, cross continent travel, their clock is disrupted. So then they have a high uh, chance to develop cancer, like uh, fire attendance has reported, has a high percentage of uh, breast cancer. And uh, also the, uh, so so definitely clock, uh, uh, circadian clock contributes to the cancer. Okay, that's very good. Uh, so now, Professor, I have one on question. Uh, you told us about uh, some uh, influenza diseases uh, in the circadian cycle, but may behavioral diseases such as autism, uh, spectrum disease uh, be influenced by the circadian clock effect uh, due to spermato spermatogenesis process? Well, uh, just I, I talk about uh, actually uh, this uh, uh, autism. Uh, autism also uh, is uh, uh, belong to one of the mood disorders. Okay, actually on my slide. So circadian clock definitely play a role uh, in pathogenesis of uh, or autism, okay? So I was gonna mention that actually, uh, this is mutual uh, uh, effects. So circadian clock in one way uh, play a role in pathogenesis of mood disorder, including autism. Also this mood disorder uh, in turn to affect circadian regulation, okay? So okay. I think uh, this is reported that uh, uh, those patients, uh, those patients also uh, display the circadian disruption. Okay, so it will be interesting to uh, separate this uh, process. Okay, hopefully you can find some uh, uh, novel targets for uh, treatment of this kind of disease. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, thank you for lecture more once, and uh, we are very very proud to. Uh, be watching your your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, bye professor. Okay. All right. My name is Mark Francis. I'm the founder of Aquaneering. For the last 20 years, Aquaneering has built a team of dedicated professionals to support your research. Our mission is simple. Provide the highest performance zebrafish housing at a reasonable cost. Our team is here to allow you to focus on your research. We at Alesco work daily to create solutions and equipment for the scientific community, contributing to the advancement of Latin America biomedical research. Our mission is greater than just providing equipment. It is to provide security with a quality service and mainly with enormous respect and attention. For this reason, we invest in high technology and seek to maintain long-lasting relationships. Our commitment is to be a reliable partner that understands the needs, the reality, and the conditions of each customer to always offer the best solution. We understand the benefits of scientific research for humanity, and this encourages us. If today we have a better quality of life, greater longevity, if we beat cancer or use a medicine for a headache, it is because the advance of biomedical research allows us to. We trust in the work of researchers, in science, and the scientific community and we pride ourselves on doing our part. Just like you, we are passionate. Science is what moves us. Because for Alesco, research is for life. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we're moving forward to our next presentation of this morning. And I'd like to, to invite, invite Dr. Robin Tangway to be here with us today, uh, right now. And so welcome, Dr. Robin Tangway. Thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation to be here today. Uh, Dr. Robin Tangway is a professor and a researcher at the Oregon State University. 
where she leads the Singhubber Aquatic Research Laboratory. She has pioneered the use of zebrafish as system and for toxicology model and has altered more than 300 manuscripts and book chapters. Her research team focuses on using phenotypic, phenotypic anchoring and coupled with the inherent molecular and genetic advantages of zebrafish to define the mechanisms by which chemicals, drugs, and nanoparticles interact with and adversely affect vertebrate uh, development and function. And she's here today to talk with us about predicting toxicity of chemicals and mixtures using multidimensional zebrafish data. And we'd like to invite you all to post your questions at the comments session, and they will be asked when her speech finishes. So welcome, Dr. Robin. Great. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you for being here today. So I'm going to get a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today is what I like to think about is the grand challenges of toxicology. I'll describe what I mean by that. And then I'm going to give three vignettes on, on examples of classes of chemicals that we're trying to tackle in order to predict um, the toxicity of, of future chemicals. And these include uh, P polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, flame retardants, and then these uh, forever so-called forever chemicals, uh, uh, PFAS compounds. And at the very end, I'm going to show some of the other new technology we're developing to, to more rapidly assess uh, phenotypes in adults in order to understand the adult consequences from uh, early life stage exposures to uh, chemicals and mixtures. So what are the grand challenges of toxicology, at least the way that I, I see them? Uh, I think we know that we're exposed to limitless combinations of man-made chemicals, and this really is limitless. Um, it doesn't mean that, that most or or many of these chemicals are hazardous, but we really don't have the tools to really tell them apart very effectively. And then the, the, they're limitless because not only are the chemicals that are intentionally produced um, by human activity, uh, but also there's transformations of these chemicals into, into other structural forms. And, and really understanding those transformations is very daunting and understanding the activities of those transformed chemicals in, in mixtures is really nearly impossible. And in reality, the toxicity of very few individual chemicals have really been evaluated. This is something that uh, surprises a lot of folks that um, you, you would think that if a chemical is going to be used in a, in a manufacturing process to be um, uh, where there'll be inevitable human exposures, that there'll be the burden would be on the companies to demonstrate that these chemicals are safe. That's actually not the case, certainly in the United States and most of the world. Um, so instead, you use the chemical, and then eventually, if they're proven hazardous, then, then there are some efforts to try to remove the chemical. So we're trying to uh, change the order of events here. Um, what we really want to know, though, is what, what chemicals have the intrinsic ability to interact with the biology to produce an adverse outcome. So, so you can see that we're, we're focusing, even though I'm a zebrafish lab, I'm not focusing on the zebrafish. I'm using the zebrafish to learn about the chemistry. So a chemical can only produce an, an adverse effect if it can interact with some important component in a biological space. Um, so, and again, that seems obvious, but not easy to, to unravel. But certainly the, the ability to interact with biology is, is uh, kind of baked in the cake. It's in the structure of the composition of these chemicals. So we wanna understand the rules that, that govern those interactions. In a, in a, for broad sense. So what is the structural basis for differential chemical activity? So if you're in a drug discovery or drug development world, you know that subtle variations in chemical structure can massively change the activity of a chemical towards its target. Uh, certainly that, that applies for uh, toxic chemicals too. So, so then once we identify, uh, if we think we can identify all the chemicals that intrinsically could interact with biology, we could predict the structural basis for the activity. Then we can understand how, what are the mechanisms um, when you identify the chemical and its target, how does it influence biology? So you'll be discovering toxic chemicals, but you'll also be discovering new biology. And then finally, how do we move this entire field of toxicology? It's a really important field to be more predictive rather than a descriptive science. So again, what we choose to do is to focus on the universe of chemicals, and we want to use the zebrafish 
um, as our as our indicator. So, so what we really want to do is we want to get as many chemicals as we possibly can. And this is actually the most difficult uh, part of the process now. And we want to bring them all through a common system. Uh, this is where toxicology struggles when there are hundreds and hundreds of different models that are being used to assess chemical activity. And so it makes it very challenging because of the, the differences in the biology to compare the results across species or across model system. So we thought, let's just try to do it all in one system in a very uh, refined, um, automated, um, consistent manner. So we, we got, grabbed the chemicals. I'll show you how we do the assessments in a second. And we really, the first cut, we wanna identify the active molecules and separate them from the non-actives. And again, we know that the majority of them are actually inactive. So how do we do this, these assessments? So first of all, that uh, I don't need to tell this audience, but um, a zebrafish is a you know, wonderful model for a number of reasons, uh, intrinsically, uh, but the life cycle, et cetera, transparency of the embryo, et cetera. But for screening, um, th there's even a, a bigger advantage. We know from uh, human studies and also uh, rodent work and certainly now all the zebrafish work that early life stages generally are more responsive to chemical insult. And there's no, no doubt about that. And, and, you know, there's a practical reason for that. Uh, we know going uh, through this life cycle, going from a single cell to an, a multicellular, multi-organ system um, in just a couple of days, you know, beating heart in 28 hours or so, it's an unbelievably complex process that takes trillions of molecular events to accomplish this, uh, this ordered um, development of life. But it's also the period where most conserved the pathways are present. So the processes to, to form a human from a single cell, fertilized uh, uh, embryo, and a zebrafish are very well conserved early in life. And then finally, we know that uh, the full genetic repertoire, so everything that a zebrafish can do in terms of an expression point of view, um, is done during early development. So from practical sense, if a chemical could only produce an adverse outcome, if a target is present, the best time to screen the universe of chemicals is when all the, the targets are present. That would be during early life stages. So this would this is a case in zebrafish, would be a case in humans and rodents, etc. So in a practical sense, that means there are fewer fewer uh, chemical blind spots. So most of the targets are expressed, and this just kind of shows you the scaling that you you know as we we do we test individual embryos in 96 well plates for a number of reasons. And so, so in a practical sense, we just want to be able to tell from uh, uh, chemical exposure, um, can we see anything that's different? We're not screening for any specific endpoint. That's actually the beauty of these screens. We're looking for anything that is different following exposure relative to the control. And then that's how we, we discriminate the actives from the inactive chemicals. So this is our, our typical timeline. Um, we... Um, all of our studies for a number of reasons, practical and legal reasons, we stop our, our studies at 120 hours post fertilization. We start our exposures at, um, so first of all, we dechorinate our embryo. So we developed an instrument that can remove the chorions from uh, zebrafish embryos at around four hours post fertilization in mass. So we do thousands of these a day. Um, but we had to, um, when we started realizing that the data would be valuable, we needed to think totally differently about how do we how do we run such a system so using systems engineering approaches first we uh, developed our own uh, mass uh, embryo production uh, systems which you can see here where we have um, need, these are the smaller ones they're about uh, 35 gallon tanks where we have several hundred uh, uh, fish cohabitated males and females and when the lights come on these little uh, lights up as you can see here uh, we get uh, massive synchronous uh, fertilization and we collect the embryos um, just by turning that valve. So, so we can get lots of embryos. We use our, our decorinator to remove the uh, chorions. Our entire facility is a specific pathogen-free facility to make sure that disease doesn't uh, interfere with our, um, our research results. Um, once we remove the chorion, it created a huge problem for us that uh, these embryos are really fragile. So we had to develop these uh, robots that can individually pick up single embryos from a well and deposit them into a, a, a 96 volt plate. You can see them working here. So you have a whole bunch of these on that. And then we, uh, through a, a number of 
um, collaborations with some companies, we uh, discovered that the need to do uh, direct digital dispensing. So this kind of shows you what a plate format is. So the, the column one is the highest concentration and we, uh, we dilute the concentration uh, this way. Um, so in order to develop a plate like this, researchers would have to uh, do multiple dilutions and uh, waste a lot of chemical. And more importantly, when you start getting to these low concentrations, you start getting chemical loss just to sticking to the plastic. So you're actually not exposing the, the embryo. So direct digital dispensing allows you to take a high concentration stock, say a 10 millimolar stock here, put it in, you can see that lights on there, uh, add the chemical there. And this, this inkjet printer basically um, injects uh, 13 picoliter droplet sizes of, of the chemical in the well the way you determine in this plate format, and it just counts the number of drops to hit the concentration you want. So it really streamlines the operation, um, uh, greatly reduces uh, air and increases throughput. And then, and then finally, at 24 hours, so so once the chemical is in at at six hours, that's when we um, um, add the the, uh, the chemicals to the plate. We seal the plate uh, to prevent evaporation. Uh, there's plenty of oxygen uh, for the fish at that life stage. And then at 24 hours is our first peak to see uh, whether anything happened from that chemical exposure across concentration. So this is the, uh, what we call the embryonic photomotor response assay. So it's really uh, looking at the spontaneous motion that zebrafish uh, do when they start around 17, 18 hours uh, post realization at 28 degrees. So you get this, this you're detecting motion under, in, under uh, infrared light. And then when you, where you see these arrows, we turn these bright lights on we illuminate the plate, which is sitting right here. And then that stimulates this activity to a, to a high degree. And then the, then the fish starts slowing down and then you hit it again with these, these white lights and then the, the animals don't respond. That's a normal response. So we asked the question across concentration of, the, of every test chemical. Again, we do 32 replicate animals at every concentration. We, we asked whether or not there was a change in either this activity, this response to light or whether or not they respond again to light. So this is really valuable information, simple assay once you build such an instrument. And what when we see hits here, they're highly correlative to effects that we see later in life. And then we don't do anything to the fish until um, 120 hours. At 120 hours, we then run it through, uh, and many of you know these systems, this is the uh, uh, Daniel Vision um, zebra boxes, where we're just doing the photomotor, uh, larval photomotor response assay. So we with the lights off, there's very little motor activity, lights uh, uh, lights on, sorry, lights off, lots of activity. So you could get these uh, uh, different epochs and we measure the fish's uh, response to those situations across concentration. We also do a larval startle response, which is the same assay, but instead of using light, we stimulate it with the acoustic signal. So we collect that data. And then we then, for every well, we then also use um, uh, human and uh, microscope assisted machine learning to detect uh, features that, that are different uh, relative to control. And these are some examples. So, so what we're, you can see that just in, in advance, we, we don't have any hypothesis about any chemical producing any effect. But what we know is that if we measure these uh, fairly simple uh, readouts, we could detect almost any toxic chemical uh, and that we've ever that anyone has ever identified. So, so we're very confident that this data is valuable. And we allow ourselves to, to look at the structure now, the concentration that these effects occur, and then and then the various endpoints. So there's lots of data for modeling. All right, so I'm gonna show you examples of how we uh, take advantage of this. So the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are, are certainly known to be um, uh, dangerous for human health. They're ubiquitous in the environment from uh, incomplete combustion, et cetera. Uh, most of our exposures, human exposures, come from inhalation, from pollution, and also ingestion from uh, contaminated food. Some are known for carcinogens um, uh, in humans. So there's only a, a, maybe a dozen and a half uh, of pHs that are mostly studied for their uh, carcinogenic potential, but there are thousands of pHs in the environment. Uh, we know that pHs are measured in placental tissue, and there's concerns and strong evidence that pHs affect um, developmental outcomes, including uh, neurobehavioral um, effects in, in people. So we really want to tackle this um, this uh, class of chemicals. So we know that if you just do a grab sample in the environment, there be, there could be hundreds of different pHs. 
again, they're environmentally dynamic. So the, um, the, these are changing from microbial and atmospheric uh, uh, changes. And sometimes these changes massively change the activity of these uh, compounds. So you end up having a bunch of these so-called parent compounds and these substituted compounds, um, the hydroxylated, nitrated, et cetera. And the toxicity data for most of these, even though they are, these have been in the environment since, since mankind, and before, uh, we don't really know what these, if these chemicals are, are hazardous. We know that many of these pHs induce um, HR dependent and HR independent toxicity. So we wanted to, this is central to, to our hypothesis. And we know that their ability to interact with this aerial hydrogen carbon receptor is dependent on the structure of these pHs. But finally, again, we lack the structural basis to predict the developmental or the neurotoxicity or cancer of these, of these compounds. So just uh, briefly introduce the, the H receptor pathway. So the H receptor is a um, the receptor that resides in cytoplasm. And then when compounds come in, they can bind the H receptor and it can translocate into the nucleus, interact with a partner, it's called ART. And then it's this HR ART complex uh, binds to specific sequences uh, across the genome to turn on, typically turn on genes. And the most commonly studied are the cytochrome P450 uh, genes and these genes for some of these ligands, once they're induced, they actively metabolize the compound, and then um, you, that uh, leads to a, a reduction in their concentration. So it's it's an, what we call as an adaptive response. So you turn on this pathway, some compounds metabolize, and it's and it's uh, the animals or the cells are protected. In some situations, you can have these compounds come in; they bind this receptor, but even though there's induction, there's no way to metabolize it. There's enzymes just can't attack. And this is dioxin as an example. There are some pHs that certainly act, operate both of these, uh, these ways, and we're working on those. There are other pHs that seem to be toxic and they do so completely independent of the H receptor pathway. So we wanna be able to, to take advantage of the sensitivity of the zebrafish model to sort the pHs based on their, their mechanism, uh, which is really important. Uh, zebrafish have three H receptors. And, uh, this kind of shows you an example of the utility of the zebrafish model. So if you look at a, a wild type fish and you expose it to uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, that's what they look like. If you expose them to a low concentration of dioxin just for an hour, um, you can see all these uh, uh, development of these phenotypes uh, a few days later. So you, you get these edemas, you get these uh, shortened snout, the, the eyes are uh, shortened, et cetera. So these are very characteristic signs of dioxin toxicity, but honestly, these are characteristic signs of most developmental toxicants in zebrafish. So these become these common endpoints, um, but common does not mean nonspecific. I wanna emphasize that. This is an example of one of the um, HR2 knockout lines that we uh, uh, developed and characterized. So this is actually from a tilling mutant, this particular one. So again, this is what, uh, uh, if you expose these guys' vehicle, they look fine. If you expose the same, that's the exact same concentration of dioxin, the only difference in this, this animal is a single point mutation, the H receptor 2G, these animals are completely normal. Um, so the toxicity of dioxin is 100% dependent on HR2. And so now we can ask this question for each one of those pHs as well. So, so this is how we did a comparative toxicity screening. I mentioned that, that it's fairly challenging to uh, get your hands on uh, bona fide standards of these uh, compounds. So what we did is we worked with Dr. Kim Anderson as part of our Superfund research program here at Oregon State University, where she gave us pHs that vary for anywhere from um, two rings to seven rings, so these low molecular weight to high molecular weight uh, pHs. And then they varied with their structure. They could be uh, aminated, hydroxylated, it could be the parent pHs, oxygenated, uh, and methylated, et cetera. So this is a diversity. There's like 140 of these um, uh, pHs. And we do all of our screening for this, this study and all of our other studies. We've screened thousands of compounds. We do it blind. We have no idea what the identity of the chemicals are before we start the studies. So in addition to, to all those phenotypes that I, that I described, because of the central potential central role of the aerial hydrocarbon receptor, in the toxicity mechanism, we decided to measure that, that gene, the cytochrome P451A gene, which is an outstanding biomarker indicating that the H receptor uh, gene has been activated. So we did uh, high throughput immunohistochemistry with all of these chemicals and kind of focused on this part of the animal. 
And then some of the examples that we saw, this would be an example of a pH that did not uh, turn on the H receptor to express cytochrome B450. We have this one where only the liver expresses um, this, this protein. So we have some where, the, where it's expressed in the skin and also in the neural mass, little donuts. And this is more typical. We see the vasculature is, um, uh, is expressed, now is expressing uh, P450, and they have the gut, and then we have the skin. So this gives us another way to discriminate or group or bin uh, pHs based on another phenotype in, in zebrafish. So, so when at the end of the day, for each one of these compounds across concentration, uh, we know we have uh, 22 morphological endpoints and two different behav behavioral endpoints, and then the CYP1A, whether it's expressed and where it was expressed. And so this is, I know these are not fun to look at, but this is a massive amount of data summarized. And what you're looking at is we calculated for each one of those endpoints, the lowest effect level concentration. That means the lowest concentration of the test chemical where you see a significant difference relative to control. So wherever you see a, um, a, a really bright blue color, uh, this color, that means the endpoint that we're, that we're tracking here on this heat map occurred at a, at a low concentration. So high, high incidence at a low concentration. Wherever it's yellow it means we saw the effect, but it took a higher concentration to see it. And what you're looking at is, and these are the, the listing of all the morphological endpoints that I described uh, down here. And then um, up here, this is the uh, embryonic photomotor response assay. And there's three different uh, parameters we measure there, um, that, that early and then the excitatory and the, what we call the refractory uh, period. And then this is the 120 hour larval photomotor response assay. And then this is just a kind of a tracking of was cytochrome P450 induced and in what tissue did that happen? And then what you're looking at here are the names of all the chemicals. So even without knowing anything, you back up. And so in terms of the morphological effects, more than half of the chemicals did not produce any morphological effects. So these chemicals do not all behave the same way. Um, you probably wouldn't expect them to, and they don't. Um, but you also see for some of the chemicals that produced uh, no effects morphologically, they do af affect the, uh, the, some of the behavioral assays. And then you have various patterns of uh, cytochrome p 450 expression. So again, those are the endpoints. And then, so now we actually have the ability to start looking at, at these, are there any organizational structure around these, uh, these hit, um, responses that we see in, in vivo. So basically what we did is we were able to cluster these into eight general clusters. So an example, all the pHs down in cluster eight did nothing. So we looked really hard. We looked at behavior. We looked at morphology. These animals look completely normal. The other extreme would be this category one where these animals are, are, are affected at very low concentration, again, because the bright blue uh, pattern. And, and they have a, a, a mixed effect on, on behavior as well. So now what we're using, we're using transcriptomics to see whether or not to test the hypothesis that the pHs in this group um, act by a similar mechanism, these in this group, similar mechanism, et cetera. So if we're, if we're lucky, we, if we just select members from each one of these categories and understand the process that, that initiates the toxic outcome, We'll be able to predict the toxicity of all pHs um, that are on the planet. So that's that's the goal. So this is an example of we we selected 16 representative pHs for transcriptomics, and again these are the categories that we picked them from. These are the compounds, um, and you can see that we have a representation of down here in category where we didn't see anything, and then we have some up here that produced these adverse effects. So how do we do transcriptomics? We do a lot of this in the lab. So um, we're pretty disciplined in the way we do the transcriptomics. We don't want to do transcriptomics when you have phenotypes. We want to identify the gene expression changes that precede the development of phenotypes to try to get at causal uh, changes. So again, we do our exposures at uh, six hours. We're going to do it to 120 hours and we pick a concentration. So the effective concentration where 80% of the animals of an pool will be affected at 120 hours. Right. And but we're not going to collect them at 120 hours. We're going to collect them at 48 hours. And the reason we do this is all right, so I explained the time point. We want to collect the gene expression changes that we think are early in the in the toxicity, um, the development pathway. 
And then the concentration, we wanted to make sure that we were, um, we're going to have a high signal to noise ratio. So say, for example, if we did an EC 100, you don't really know whether you're at 100% because you could be at, um, you know, 10 times that. So you don't know where you're at at the top of the scale. And if you're too low, say it was at a 10% concentration, if you grabbed a pool, that would be 90% of the animals in your pool are normal. So that's not a very good signal. So the EC80 is the, the, the number we picked. And then we um, do the analysis. So we did this with those 16 pHs and we ended up having two main clusters. We had this cluster A and this cluster B. So um, I'm just gonna talk about uh, cluster B. So we first, we found with these, um, these are the names of the, the pHs. When we do these uh, uh, pathway enrichment. So you can see that these, these, there's a lot of gene expression changes which are very common between all of these pHs, which, uh, which was somewhat surprising to us. But, but the reason they're breaking into these different categories is because each one of these pHs, in addition to these uh, common gene expression changes, produce these unique uh, pathway um, perturbations. This is what's making them behave differently. So now we're trying to understand um, how do they initiate the same process? All of these are HR2 dependent. We've done this with the knockout lines. So we know that that's the initiating event is HR activation. But what we think is the structural differences and metabolism of these compounds are producing kind of a second wave of effect in the animal. And this is this is what we're pursuing. And this kind of shows we were able to find um, uh, differentially expressed genes in each one of these categories. So we've identified new biomarkers that are far better uh, predictors of toxicity than just the sip one gene. So, so these, these are now being uh, tools for uh, assessing mixtures of pHs. This is one interesting uh, um, observation that we found. We had this uh, particular pH um, where, where we, if we look at the, the phenotype, um, we, we knew this was an HR dependent phenomenon. We see this is what the, the caudal fin fold looks like um, in, the, in the DMSO treated. And when you just BKF, this is one of these larger molecular weight uh, pHs, we actually noticed that there was a duplication of the fin, which we had never seen before. So we, so this this clearly tells us that this class of, of pHs behave differently than than the other ones in this category, and so we figured out is that the we wanted to determine the windows of sensitivity and then when the phenotype uh, developed. And so what we did is we and this was the beauty beauty of the zebrafish system. So if you do a continuous exposure from six to 120 hours, 93 percent of the animals have this phenotype. If you hold back the chemical, let the animal get the 24 hours, and then hit hit them with the chemical, about 70% of them get, get the phenotype. So bottom line is if, if the chemical needs to be present between 12 and 36 hours to produce uh, the phenotype in, in most of the animals. So this is where the action is. This is where the animal is, is being affected. Um, again, we know it's HR dependent. So if this one we actually do with morpholinos. Um, if you um, control morpholino and you add the BKF, you still get this fin fold. Um, if you knock out HR1A, you still get it. HR1B, um, you still get it. But the HR2 morpholino, you get a complete normal phenotype. So this is an HR2-dependent uh, phenomenon. We tried to see, we, we think metabolism is, is the answer here. So we tried to use this um, uh, nitroreductase um, uh, transgene by adding this prodrug. So basically, you can ablate the liver. So since most of metabolism occurs in the liver, uh, but actually what we found is that if you, even in the absence of, of the liver, you still get the phenotype. So, so this, we, we actually think we have extra hepatic metabolism that is um, acting upon uh, this, this compound to produce a secondary effect. So there's another target of the metabolite. So this is what we're pursuing right now. I'm going to turn my attention real quick to, to flame retardant. So many of you have heard about these uh, chemical uh, classes. Uh, benefits of flame retardants, they reduce risk. They, because they slow the fire spread and heat release and they reduce hazard. The problem is the biological safety information, like I described in my introduction, um, is lacking. It's not that really the industry's fault because they weren't required to demonstrate safety. All they had to do is demonstrate that these compounds uh, reduce um, fire risk. So then, so once uh, you start identifying hazardous chemicals, then you start replacing these chemicals with new flame retardants. But again, those often have, are tested. So we've been working in this space for a long time now, and we really asked the question, how can a toxicologist help? Um, can we identify the hazardous um, 
uh, flame retardants? Can we help them select better replacement chemicals? And more importantly, can we use the zebrafish model to uh, assist in the design of more benign or, or safer chemicals before they're released into the public? So this is what we're working on. So, so what we did is we worked with the United States uh, uh, EPA and the National Toxicology Program, and we, we got our hands on as many flame retardants as we could. So first of all, this is what they look like. So each one of these chemicals works as a flame retardant, but it doesn't take um, a lot of expertise to identify that the structure of these are quite different. I grouped them based on categories. So there's no reason to think that all of these chemicals are going to behave the same way uh, in a biological system. Um, so these are the, uh, the chemical categories. So we, we did this, we grabbed these chemicals, we ran into the same systems that I, that I described before. And typically we do 10, 10 test concentrations. Uh, we normalize it to DMSO. We do two replicate plates and 16 per plate. So N32, and again, we measured all of those endpoints. And again, this is a different way to represent the data. So we're, we're looking at, um, these are the kind of the morphology, just a few of the morphology endpoints. This is the name of all the chemicals. Wherever you see uh, no dot, again, that means if it's white, that means we didn't see an effect. Wherever you see a big red dot, that means that um, we saw a toxic effect at a very low concentration. And so, so you can see just even from the morphological um, point of view, most of these compounds are, are pretty toxic um, to, to, to zebrafish. Now, if you overlay, how do they behave in behavior? And so you're looking at the, the uh, embryonic photomotor response assay, the, the 24 hour, and then the five day uh, larval photomotor response assay. Uh, the few chemicals that were not toxic in terms of the morphological effect are, are pretty toxic in, in terms of producing um, uh, uh, hyperactivity, which is indicated by yellow. So again, bigger the yellow dot, uh, more effects on uh, behavior at a lower concentration. So these compounds have a not a very good safety safety profile. But even so, so that was a, a new observation. We shared this data with the manufacturers and also the, the U.S. government, et cetera. Um, so what else do we do with this? So how, how are these chemicals interacting with biology? So again, we, we turned it to transcriptomics again, using the same paradigm I described, collecting at uh, 48 hours post fertilization. In this case, we, we uh, separated the RNA for the mRNA and the small RNA and did RNA sequencing in both pools. And, and this is kind of a summary. So if you're looking at, these are some of the ones we selected. These are the abbreviations, not important that you know that. Um, and we're looking at the number of transcriptional changes that go up versus down. And you can see that similar to the phenotypes at the mRNA level, um, lots of transcriptional changes produced for most of these chemicals uh, with the exception of this one. This is the only the one that did not produce a phenotype and we also don't see gene expression changes. So some of these gene expressions are, uh, they're dominated by elevated gene expression changes, but there are some uh, repressed as well. And then looking at the same exact pools of RNA, but looking at small RNAs, you can see that a lot of microRNAs are just dysregulated as well. So then we ask the question, are the relationships, are the predicted relationships between the mirrors in these yellow balls um, that are um, that might explain the changes in gene expression um, of some of the mRNAs? And so these are the mirrors, and you can see that there's, there are some genes like the vitamin D receptor, um, which is uh, predicted to be regulated by the mirror 125B, 5P, and, um, and, and some of its darn downstream genes are, are affected by almost all of these uh, uh, pHs. So we have, we're now uh, teasing out these individual relationships between the structure of the, the flame retardant and the dysregulation of the mirror and its regulation of mRNA. So this is an ongoing effort. Uh, my last example, I'm going I'm to talk about our PFASs. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about uh, the global challenge of um, uh, PFASs. They're ubiqu ubiquitous in the environment. That most, not all, are persistent in the environment. Some bioaccumulate and certainly have been widely detected in, in human blood and breast milk and certainly in, in uh, environmental species as well. But I still think we have a major research gap is understanding the environmental and human health effects of this large group. And again, this is another large thousand, uh, thousands of chemicals in this group. Just an example, again, uh, our first goal was to compare the toxicity of all of these PFAS molecules and some of their structural categories are here um, in a single system. Again, don't have to extrapolate between uh, 
frogs and fish and chickens and humans do everything in zebrafish so we can uh, focus on the chemical. What we want to do, we want to get our hands on as many of these compounds as we can, which is very challenging. And we want to do concentration response uh, uh, studies like I described. And we want to then uh, look for uh, structural relationships between uh, various structures of these compounds and the activities we identified. Again, trying to, to move towards uh, predictivity. And what we did is, and this is just one of the examples, so we worked with the US EPA, we got 139 compounds from them and they had various, uh, lots of different uh, structures. So what, what's common about uh, PFAS is, is this common, this uh, carbon uh, fluorine bond of various lengths. You end up having, sorry, go back here. Uh, you end up having these long chains where these uh, fairly stable carbon fluorine bonds, but you end up having these different head groups. So again, there's no reason to expect that this chemical is gonna behave the same as uh, this chemical, or be, this, these chemicals are gonna behave the same. Uh, so again, we, we ran these and we did these blind again. And what we found is, again, I'm just only going to summarize it very quickly here. Uh, we did these exposures and we collected all the morphological data, the behavioral data, and then we calculated uh, what we call the, uh, the benchmark dose or the benchmark concentration, where we get this uh, uh, statistical change at where 10% of the animals are affected. So it's a, it's a sensitive measure that is commonly used in the regulatory sector. And when we ran all 139 of these compounds, the vast majority didn't produce a behavioral effect or a morphological effect. Some did. So it was about 40 of them that, that either produced uh, uh, embryonic larval uh, behavior changes or morphology. So now we're, it allows us to focus our energies on the chemicals that were, um, which were toxic. So we're starting to, to run these categories and, and uh, chemical property relationships. So looking at the, structural categories, uh, the molar mass, the volatility, and the so-called uh, tox break chemotypes, uh, doing machine learning to try to identify the structural features that are predictive of toxicity. This is a large uh, ongoing uh, effort. So finally, just to show some of the other tools. So we like building instruments and uh, deploying them to answer important questions. So what we realize is that um, although the early life stage zebrafish is wonderful for, for rapidly screening uh, chemicals, some of the, the phenotypes and the diseases that we're measuring in humans are, are really later in life. So could we develop some tools to more rapidly uh, uh, screen for those phenotypes? So the idea, again, um, the way we're operating now is we do, we want to understand these adult consequences by doing developmental exposures um, from normally zero to five days and then we remove the chemical. So we collect all the data that I described. So we'll have all this information across concentration. And it will identify the concentration where the animals um, at five days look completely normal, but the chemicals at higher concentration produce these effects. And then we grow them up in chemical-free water in our large facility. And then we prepare to do adult assays. So we have to do enough of these exposures to get enough males and females so we can separate them. And then we're going to run them through a bunch of uh, adult phenotyping. So we do uh, autorespiration where we measure cardiovascular fitness, um, um, oxygen consumption with exercise. We have a shuttle box that, that uses uh, associated learning uh, to, to detect um, the ability to associate a, a light condition to safety. Uh, and then shoaling, looking at uh, social interactions, response to predator, and then a startle response. So we did is we built, we have a, a big room that we built so we can do like 48 of these animals in this battery um, in, in a single uh, uh, a few hour block. This just kind of shows you what the, uh, the, this is commercially available. We didn't build this one. We're, we're exercising the fish and measuring the, the group's oxygen consumption over time. This is um, a, where we're actually looking at um, social interaction. This is one where we actually have four fish per tank and um, the software um, is, we have a camera on the other side of the room that's measuring the, the, the distance between uh, fish, the inter-individual distance and the nearest neighbor uh, over time. And so we can do this uh, uh, in a very rapid way. Uh, this is a system that uh, does multiple assays. So what you're looking down, there's a camera that's looking, that has the same view that you have, looking at these fish in these little boxes. This fish cannot see out this side, this side, this side. They can only see out on this side. So they can't see each other and what this is what's on this surface is an led uh, monitor so we can project images 
So, um, and then the fish interact with it. This particular test, there's just a, a bright light on this side. So the fish aren't interacting with the screen. And what we're doing is we're tapping these fish with the solenoid, which is, you can kind of see them below here. Um, when you get a tap, the fish uh, swim a lot. The camera detects the activity. They slow down, tap again, tap again. So you, you get to measure their response to the tap. You get to measure their habituation over time. And then this again is measuring these effects in animals that were exposed only during development, like uh, 90 days prior to the study. This is an example of what the fish are looking at in the video, um, in the predator. So this, these, these fish are seeing this uh, screen. And what you see is the fish almost immediately when this is projected, they go to the other side of the tank. That's a normal response. So we can measure whether or not um, this normal uh, response to, to predator is affected by chemical exposure. And then this is again, the associated learning where we, we have a, a divider where the fish can swim uh, side to side and we have LED lights that, that illuminate each side of the box. And we just want them to make an as, uh, associate, say in this case, the correct side is green. And um, we want them to make that decision fairly quickly or they'll get a gentle shock in the system. So, so this is a very sensitive system and, um, and, and we run 30 to 50 trials uh, per fish to get the, this learning curves. And then finally, all of this can be used and we are using it to look at uh, transgenerational effects. So again, the chemical exposures that occur early development and by the F2 generation, which is the epigenic generation, we ask whether or not these chemical exposures had these effects that, that persist uh, throughout uh, uh, this exposed lineage. And uh, so, and we have a number of chemicals where that is actually the case. And with the beauty of the zebrafish system is, um, I'm most I'm not really that interested in what these epigenetic effects are. I want to understand how did they get initiated during the exposures. So we really focus as much as we can on the beginning rather than the end of our um, of these endpoint measurements. And it's just just an example of the LPR assay uh, across generations. In the in the F zeros, you see this hyperactivity of the LPR in the exposed um, animals, and this hyperactivity persists in F2 and even F4 generations. This is a permanent effect on, um, on, on these uh, lineages. So we're trying to understand what happened during F0 to, to set these animals up forever to be hyperactive uh, under this assay. All right, I know that was quick, but uh, so to summarize, I think high throughput in vivo zebrafish data is really now routine in the lab. Uh, we collaborate with uh, companies and countries, and um, so we still have uh, bandwidth for collaboration. Um, this phenotypic anchoring for discovering pathways is really powerful, um, and uh, as is for the platform for structure-based predictions. So uh, we're working with companies that are giving us uh, chemicals, which is just moderate, uh, modest variation on structure, and letting us give them the information quickly on what impact that those uh, structural modifications have on activity. Um, what I didn't talk about today is really amenable for mixtures assessment. This is a huge problem in, in risk assessment. We certainly know humans are only exposed to chemicals through mixtures, and uh, they really don't have the tools to, to understand how to uh, do mixture work. So we've been working with our chemists who actually collect these uh, real world mixtures, so make really complex samples, and they, we run them through our system very quickly. And then it's called effect-directed analysis, where you take, uh, uh, you fractionate the chemical based on uh, chemical uh, property, and then we reassess each fraction to find the chemical uh, fraction, the fractions of chemicals that are producing the effects. It really helps them uh, prioritize which samples to do the chemistry on. Um, so that's a really valuable approach. Uh, we're working with uh, folks who are charged with trying to clean up in the environment or cleaning up water supplies. And uh, so they have various technologies to, to, to make that happen. So we were able to assess the, the kind of the dirty water uh, before they treat it, and then we can actually uh, assess the effectiveness on the back end. And this is really important because in many cases, you have no idea what uh, resulting chemicals you produce. They actually may be more hazardous than what you started with. And the zebrafish, because of the sensitivity and very few blind spots, we can, de we can uh, detect based on activity whether or not um, this was a successful uh, endeavor. So I think translating zebrafish data is increasingly possible, and, uh, and I'm really excited about what I think the impact that the field might have on human health in the, the years to come. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have.
Oop, I can't hear you. I can't hear you if you're talking. Sorry. <laughs> I was on mute. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for this marvelous speech. Me, I, as a, uh, as a toxicologist, I'm completely mesmerized, <laughs> especially by the behavioral tests. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> So we have two questions from the audience. Uh, the first of all is the first one is from Bianca from Ushpi. Uh, she asks, "Can you explain a little more about the low effects level that you showed in the PHA PAH part of the presentation?" Sure. So, so um, there are lots of ways to analyze the response data st statistically. Um, and what's really difficult in the zebrafish model is that these, these endpoints start interacting with each other. So uh, we want to screen them one by one and, and express, we need to, we some need, some way we need to summarize it to a value that could be translated to other uh, toxicological system. So the lowest effects level is simply every endpoint in isolation compared to the control. What is the concentration where, where we see a significant um, difference relative to the control. So you might, in the, in the 22 endpoints, um, the LELs will be will be varied for each one of the endpoints. So like a, the pericardial edema, the LEL might be uh, one nanomolar, and then the LEL for um, uh, shortened snout or something might be uh, 50 micromolar. Um, and so if you wanted to summarize what any effect that happened on the animal, then it would be that nanomolar uh, concentration that would be summarized. Uh, it's 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 just many many ways of doing it. A lot of times for our transcriptional data, what we've been doing is we we have other statistical methods to kind of look for any effect and defining a the concentration, the lowest effect level to produce any effect and to boil it all down to one concentration. And that that seems to be resonate well with the non zebrafish people. They like it simple. Um, so so this benchmark dosing of any effect is really kind of where we're or our limb system is now just spitting that data out to our, our collaborators. And the next question is from Renata. Uh, she's asking if, do you think these methodologies can be applied for other groups of chemical compounds yep. and also for mixtures? Yep, exactly. Yeah, great question. Yeah, we're, we're doing that for thousands and thousands of, of chemicals uh, every year now. Um, the only limits, and this is not unique to zebrafish, would be solubility. And um, so if you have chemicals that will not go into, into an aqueous solution, that becomes problematic. And really, it's impossible to do those studies in, um, in cell culture as well for the same reasons, because those are also aquatic systems, right? <laughs> um, and then the other thing, sometimes there's modifications, um, like volatile compounds. So if you compounds that are tend to fall out of solution. So we can run, we can do volatile compounds, but we have to run our system in seal. It's completely sealed, no headspace. Um, so we can do volatiles as well. Um, but other than that, the, um, it's limitless on the, the range of chemicals that we could um, evaluate in the system. Very nice. Uh, so the, the it's not a question, it's actually a, a statement. And I corroborate for us toxicologists. It's an honor to take your lecture. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for participating in this webinar. And I hope to see you again okay. soon because your talk was perfect. Uh, thank you. Too and bad I couldn't, I couldn't go there. That would been more fun. <laughs> yes, next time Michael Kent comes to Brazil, please come with him. <laughs> okay, yeah. you tell him to drag me along. <laughs> <laughs> you can be sure I'm going to tell him. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. So thank you. And everybody, we'll be back soon, soon for our next pre presentation, okay? Don't leave. <laughs>
with a secondary quality control inspection in our Heidelberg office. As we say, we only carry the best and offer a multitude of fine microsurgical instruments like spring scissors, forceps and rangers, but also a variety of options for wound closures and animal identification. In addition to our three FST offices, we have over 50 distributors worldwide. While the majority of the audience is based in the USA, please note that we can ship anywhere in the world and any products not listed in our physical catalog or online at findscience.com can be sourced as a special order and we will work with you to get you what you need. Before we start, for those who are unfamiliar with FST, let me go over our core values we hold ourselves to and strive to provide to our customers. Quality. Impeccable product quality is what differentiates FST from the others. Secondly, our customer support. We strive for 100% customer satisfaction. Lastly, our QC department in Germany upholds our manufacturers to the standards FST and our customers expect with every instrument. Estão me ouvindo, pessoal? Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rita Fior to you in this presentation. Uh, she's developmental biologist at Champ Limou Center in Lisbon, uh, where she is a leader group. She has dedicated herself to study the cellular and the molecular interactions that occur between human tumor cells and cells of zebrafish in the immune system. And more recently, she became interested in personalized therapy for cancer, aiming to contribute to improve the success in the treatment of this disease by using zebrafish avatar. Dr. Rita, I would Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Take your time. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, good morning or good afternoon. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about the work we are developing at the Champalimo Foundation. So my lab has two main research arms. One is really to take the zebrafish avatar model to the clinical practice, and I'll explain in a minute. And the other part of my lab is really interested in and in studying the interactions between tumor cells and innate immunity. Okay, so what are zebrafish avatars? Um, these are patient-derived xenographs in zebrafish. Okay, so I started developing the zebrafish avatar model really because um, when I realized that there are no tests like an antibiogram for chemotherapy. So many times um, in oncology, um, there are several equivalent options uh, for patients for treatment because in clinical trials, it has been shown that different drugs have similar response rates. However, many times there are no biomarker to tell for that patient which is the best treatment. So these patients go through rounds of trial and error to find the best treatment and being uh, subjected to a lot of toxicity and they lose time of treatment, of course. So really, this was my driving force to develop an in vivo model, uh, a PDX, but quick enough to help decision making. Okay, so what we do in the lab is to take tumor cells from patients, either from surgery, biopsies, or liquids that have that are enriched in tumor cells, and then we get these tumor cells, we label them fluorescently, and we microinject little zebrafish embryos of two days post fertilization. Then our next day we start treatments, which can be chemotherapy, biological therapies, or even radiotherapy. And then after the treatments, two, three days of treatment, what we do, we stop the assay and we do an immunofluorescence for activated caspase 3 to look at apoptosis, cell death, and see if these treatments induced, in fact, induced cell death or not, or whether there is a treatment that is better than the other. This is our big goal, is really to help MDs choose the best option for their patients and, and help patients also choose their best option. And... Um, 
you will also see that we can look uh, at tumor cells and tumor size because we have single cell resolution. And also you'll see that we can also study the potential, the angiogenic potential of these cells and also the metastatic potential. And the idea is that e this assay can be performed in two weeks. This is our big goal. Okay, so here's a video uh, that we had to do for a paper. Uh, where we explain how we micro-inject, just to have an idea. So these are two days post-fertilization embryos, and here's a bit of tricane to anesthetize them. And here is Myra, a PhD student, that what she's going to show is to take tumor cells, put it inside the microcapillary, and then we micro-inject these uh, tumor cells into the fish under the stereoscope. Uh, as you'll see, we can... Well, a trained researcher can inject around 200 fish per hour, more or less. And so we micro-inject these tumor cells in the peribitline space here. Uh, so you see the eye, the heart beating, and here is the space between the yolk and this membrane. And we do not inject in the yolk because, in general, cells tend to die in the yolk. So we inject in this space is, is equivalent to the subcutaneous injection. Okay and we can have numbers. This is the big advantage. So then we go to the confocal of the treatment where we have really single cell resolution. And we can use transgenics that label, for instance, the vessels, and then we can zoom in into the tumors and to have this uh, single cell resolution. As I said before, look at the structures, look at the vessels and other tumor microenvironment components. Okay. We also, uh, we had first to show that human tumor cells are able to proliferate in the fish. This is a EDU uh, staining after two hours treatment in the water of the fish. So you just put EDU for two hours and incorporates the DNA of cycling cells. We also here see a breast cancer in red tumor cell that is able to, uh, several tumor cells that are able to recruit blood vessels from the fish. We can also see that some human tumor cells are able to migrate and disseminate along the fish and forming micrometastasis. You have here in the brain, in the eye, you see the retina, the lens, and we see it also in the gills, for instance, and in the tail of the fish. This is an example of what we look at when we are doing the screening of drugs. Uh, in general, we want to see the impact of these drugs on cell death. So activated caspase 3 staining that specifically label cells undergoing apoptosis. And this is an extreme example of two chemotherapy combinations that are given in colorectal cancer, and they are considered equivalent because in clinical trials, they showed similar response rates. Therefore, and there is no biomarker to tell for this patient, I'm going to give full FOX and not full FIDI because of this, because there is no biomarker to tell which are the tumors that are more sensitive to one than another. And so patients, if they start with full FOX, it doesn't work, go to full FIDI and vice versa. And here is an example in a cell line, HET, where you can actually see very well that it's much more sensitive to full fee than to full FOX. And here in these graphs is just to show how we do, how we show our data. And each dot is a xenograph, so one single tumor. So this allows us to do statistics and to analyze the data with more power um, because we have these numbers. Of course, it will always depend on the, the, the sample that you have, how much more tumor cells, you can do more xenographs. So this has been published. So we, we had to show the feasibility. We had to show that we could see differences in response of the different um, colorectal cancer cell lines. Then we went to patients and we showed that in the mice, we had similar results. And then we went to patients and we were able to correlate the response in the clinic with the avatar in four out of five patients in colorectal cancer. This was published. Now, we've been doing several studies and uh, uh, in different uh, types of cancer, not only colorectal cancer, where we are increasing the cohort. We have uh, now around 50 patients in rectal cancer, pancreatic, stomach cancer, breast, ovarian, bladder. And also, we developed protocols for targeted therapies like cetuximab, bevacizumab, and olaparib. And this is really, I just want to make this point, it, this is really um, 
only possible through a very close collaboration with the clinicians uh, in the Champagne Foundation, where we, we have a hospital, but also with other hospitals in Lisbon. And it's been great uh, to work so close with the clinic and with uh, so close to the patients. Uh, so now, these last years, what we've been doing is really to do like co-clinical trials, meaning we want, really want to um, validate the model and determine the predictive value of the model because um, we need to prove that. So what we've been doing these last years was really comparing the patient clinical response to treatment with their matching avatar to see if the avatar can predict what's going to happen to the patient, basically. So we have a patient that goes to chemotherapy, then this patient can either have a good response and control the disease, or it can progress. And so the chemotherapy didn't really work or the therapy. So we get these tumor cells from these patients and we, we generate the avatars. And then we have a group of controls. And then we have a group of, of avatars that are treated exactly with the same chemotherapy that the patient was treated, the same patient. And then we compare, did the avatar respond? Did the patient respond or not respond? The avatar did not respond. What happened to the patient? Did it progress? These are what we are trying to see and match the avatar with their patient. We are wrapping now two stories, one in colorectal cancer and the other in breast cancer, uh, where we have in colorectal cancer, we have around 55 patients, 50 patients, and we have a positive predictive value of 92% and the negative predictive value of 75%. In breast cancer, we have less patients, but we have 100% predictive value. What we cannot distinguish is whether we have a pathological complete response or a partial response, but we can distinguish at least responders from non-responders. And these results are really promising, I think, and really positive, showing that the model can actually predict a uh, response to the therapy. Uh, and so we are moving to the next step. So yesterday I submitted a, a clinical trial protocol where we're going actually to compare um, physician choice or avatar choice uh, in patients. There are several options of treatment and there is no biomarker to tell which is the best option. And we are going only to test the, the options, therapeutic options that are present in the guidelines. So it's not new treatments. It's within the options that are present in the guidelines, having a test to direct treatment, is it better for the progression, free survival of these patients or not? This is what we're going to try to go for. Okay, so now switching gears, the other part of my lab is really studying how tumor cells interact with innate immunity. And this in fact all started with a question which was, I was not understanding why some human tumors were implanting so well in the fish and implantation means four days. So this is a very short assay. So we inject, you know, 100 fish and you have 100 fish with tumors. And then you look after four days and you still have 100 fish with tumors. That means it's 100%. Okay. But we had some other tumors that we injected. And after four days, instead of 100%, we had like 20%. So 80% of the fish just disappeared the tumor. And this was really puzzling. We started thinking maybe just, you know, just missing some survival cues from the human cells in the fish. But then um, we started thinking that maybe this was not the case. And in fact, if we look at this Im uh, live imaging um, of the tail of the fish, so that's another advantage of the model is that we can take the, the zebrafish embryos with the tumors, the avatars, or xenographs with their cell lines and put it under the microscope and, and, and just film it. And what we realized was that, for instance, here using a transgenic that labels myeloid cells, you see that the red cells, the tumor cells, look like they're being chased by e immune cells. And some are being phagocytized by them, but others seem completely visible to the immune system. So then what we did was really to focus on two cell lines that were derived from the same patient, but they had these completely opposing phenotypes. And these are the SW480s and SW620 cell lines that were derived from the same patient. One is from a primary tumor, and this one is a regressor, so it gets rejected. And the other one is uh, was extracted from a lymph node metastasis from the same patient, but then implants really well in the fish. 
So this work was spearheaded by Vanda Povo, PhD student in the lab that she already finished. And so what Vanda did was really start, okay, so if these cells, the 620, are able to evade the immune system, what happens if we mix them together? Can they also protect the 480s from being cleared? So to do that, we can label the cells uh, in different colors and then mix them. And I hope you can see here that 480 implants re not so good, so around 30%, so 70% of the fish uh, get cleared. And then in the 620s, you see a high implantation rate. Now, if we mix them together, now the 480s goes to the double, but the 620 also reduces, okay? So these results really suggest that uh, somehow the 620s can protect a bit the 480s from being clear, but also the 480s are influencing the 620s. Okay, so next, what Wanda went to do was really to see if these tumor cells are able to modulate the tumor microenvironment. Can we see differential recruitment of neutrophils and macrophages to these tumors? And so she quantified the number of cells around the tumors. And as you can see here, the 480s can recruit much better neutrophils and macrophages than the sequence than the 620s, which have much lower numbers in their tumor microenvironment. But what I think is really cool is that when you mix one to one, now this tumor microenvironment is more similar to the 620. So suggesting that 620 becomes dominant uh, on the tumor microenvironment and really um, dominating and dictating how the tumor microenvironment actually is. And I think that uh, was really cool. So then what Wanda did was to look at the um, polarization of the macrophages and, and see if uh, we could see differences in the modulation of the polarization if you have more M1-like, more inflammatory macrophages, or more M2-like. And I hope you can appreciate here that 480s are able to recruit much more TNF positive macrophages, so M1-like macrophages, than 620, and 620 tumor microenvironment is more enriched in TNF negative microenvironment, the macrophages, sorry. So then what, what uh, we did was really to inject these cells in ipomorphs, mutants for the innate immune cells. So mutants that have low neutrophils like the RENX and mutants that have low macrophages like the panther. So the idea was, okay, are these cells really uh, responsible for this clearance and implantation phenotype. And in fact, what we see is that in these mutants, now uh, 480 cells implant much better, okay? Much better than in the wild type. However, 620, they're not affected, okay? So suggesting really that neutrophils and macrophages are playing a role in this clearance uh, phenotype. So then to confirm this, we did an, uh, uh, another experiment where we can uh, chemically deplete the macrophages using l clodronate So here I hope you can see, so when they inject it um, in a background that labels macrophages, the MPEG transgenic, I hope you can see here, they are recruited to the tumor in controls in LPBS, but then when we inject with l clodronate you see a complete ablation, almost complete ablation of macrophages, and now with this uh, l clodronate you can see that implantation goes to almost 100%. Also, tumor size increases. So really showing how macrophages have a major impact on, on the tumor and on the clearance of these tumors. Okay, so finally, we did an experiment where I really wanted to see if there was innate immunoediting happening in zebrafish. So there was selection or not of, the, of different... Uh, clones of immune selection because there's no time for evolution, right? So what we did was, uh, so when they injected the CSW480 parental cells, at one day post-injection, you have all the tumors. Then at four days, some just disappear, but some are able to be there. So they're scapers, we call them scapers. So we dissected the scapers, grow them in culture, and then micro-inject them again. And I hope you can see here, now these tumors are much bigger and implant much better, and also recruit less macrophages. So suggesting that these scapers are so immunologically selected in the fish, they have these characteristics, right? 
So then the referees wanted to know the signaling pathways that are uh, involved in this. And for that, we designed another experiment using single cell RNA-seq, which I think it also illustrates the power of the zebrafish model, where we can um, go and understand what is happening and which subclones are being selected and so on. So what we did was to inject again. And then at one day post injection, we dissect all the tumors, not all the tumors, some of the tumors, because we leave some fish uh, until four days. Okay, half of the fish go to four days. And then at four days post injection, we dissect the escaper tumors, the ones that were not clear, right? And then we did single cell sort seek, and I hope you can see now the difference between one day and four day post injection. So at one day, we have all the subclones present. But at four days, we have some subclones that disappear or reduce a lot, right? And others that expand. And if we look at the signaling pathways that are present, what we were able to see was that this major clone that completely, almost completely disappears is highly enriched in notch signaling, notch activation, very clear notch activation, and interferon gamma. But the, the subclone that expands is really enriched in wind signaling and also has an IL-10 signature. So we are exploring this, trying to understand more of the signaling pathways that is happening here. We also sequencing 620 and trying to go a bit deeper into the mechanisms of this. So now I'm switching to the last story, which is unpublished, where we um, developed a new model for bladder cancer and BCG immunotherapy. BCG immunotherapy is the oldest immunotherapy that it's uh, given to patients. And it was really developed based on the coli vaccine. And the idea is that you can boost the immune system to clear the rest of the tumor in case of the bladder cancer. So Maida, what she did to develop this model is she injected bladder cancer cells into two days post transition zebrafish embryos. And then the next day, she gives she organizing two groups, one that will be injected with BCG and others with PBS control. So, and then after two days, she gives a boost of BCG and a boost of PBS. And at four days post injection, we stop the assay and analyze the impact of BCG injection. And I hope you can appreciate here what happens is when we have BCG plus the booster, we have an uh, increase in clearance. Now we're talking about clearance, not implantation. So it's exactly the opposite. So the disappearance of tumors is increased when we inject the BCG. And also what she was able to see is that BCG really induces a massive apoptosis in these tumors. She was also able to see that if she puts just BCG and the tumor cells in vitro, she cannot see this induction of apoptosis. So suggesting that this could be a cell autonomous, non-cell autonomous effect. And that's why we went to look at the tumor microenvironments that we already were uh, thinking about it, uh, in fact. But she could not see any difference in the recruitment of neutrophils, but she could see a major recruitment of macrophages towards the tumor upon BCG injection. She could also see a major switch on the polarization of the macrophages upon BCG injection. So in controls, you have much more M2-like, so TNF negative. And, but when you inject BCG, there's a switch and you uh, induce uh, TNF uh, signaling. Then she wanted to see, okay, is this really dependent on macrophages? So again, we use the l quadrinate experiment and let's go slowly. What we see is with PBS, we have this 30% basal clearance. So 70% implantation, 30% clearance. Uh, now, if we put l quadrinate we take out the macrophages, this basal clearance uh, reduces. So we have less, less clearance, but you inject BCG, major clearance, 54% of clearance. Now we give BCG, but we take out the macrophages. Now there's no clearance anymore. And also it's very clear that apoptosis is not induced anymore when you take out the macrophage. We take out the players, the macrophage player. Okay, so then what might, uh, uh, so we, what we would like to, to do when we did was really to see if the model would have resolution to distinguish between different BCG strains or vaccines. Because uh, in the last years, there's been a major effort to uh, develop new BCG vaccines. And so we established 
and more efficient vaccines. So we established a collaboration with Stefan Kaufman, who's a tuberculosis uh, ex expert in the field, of course. And so he gave us the strain and and then the paternal the maternal strain the the conventional strain, and the idea is that these new strains are more immunogenic, more efficient, and to see if we could see difference in our model in our short in vivo model. And what we saw was that clearance, we cannot see much difference between the two strains, but what we could see was much more apoptosis, more induction of apoptosis with the new VPM strain, more recruitment of macrophage, and a more efficient polarization towards M1-like macrophages, showing that we have this uh, resolution to see this difference on these two strains. So next, Myras was doing long-term live imaging to look at tumor clearance. How is this happening? How are macrophages killing the tumor cells? And so she did several analyses and I'm going to play all the movies at the same time. So it's uh, less confusing or more confusing, I don't know. Uh, so what we were able to see and Maida was able to see and quantify was that when you have BCG or VPM, you, say, you see much less of these uh, elongated macrophages, they become more rounded, more phagocyt with more phagocytic activity. Of course, they're phagocyting a lot. And but what was really cool was that these macrophages were touching each other much more. And with the BPM, they were almost fusing, or we, we're not sure, but it looks like they're they're fusing with each other, which is reminiscent of a granuloma formation, which is typical of BCG and tuberculosis. Okay, so just to wrap up, so we are really interested on studying these uh, interactions between innate immunity and tumor cells. We want to understand how tumor cells are able to escape innate immunity or how they're being recognized by the immune system of the fish and to try to find like new don't eat me signals. We're trying to find also compounds that can boost this clearance a phenotype that in the future might be um, complemented with uh, immune checkpoint therapies, for instance, to, to increase efficacy rates. So I'm finishing. So thank you so much for listening. I'd like to thank my team, amazing people that I work with. And I'm really lucky, my collaborators, the platforms from the Champalimo Foundation, amazing fish platform, the biobank and all the other platforms. I'd like to thank collaborators, also reagents, uh, our zebra fish, um, community is really uh, generous. I'd like to thank my mentors and funding and you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, we are so proud of your presentation and we hope that uh, the I, I am vaccinated with the microinjection in zebrafish and with the studies regarding to tumor cells and uh, these kind of things that uh, hope to understand the human tumors in a so uh, easy uh, tool <laughs> that is zebrafish. That uh, we know, we work with zebrafish, we know that it's not so, so easy. But uh, when we compare with other organisms or including with the study with humans, the, in, the tumor in humans is um, a perfect tool that I can uh, believe that will help us. Great talk, <laughs> Professor Rita. Uh, thank thank you. you so much and congrats for your presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much. My name is Mark Francis. I'm the founder of Aquaneering. For the last 20 years, Aquaneering has built a team of dedicated professionals to support your research. Our mission is simple. Provide the highest performance zebrafish housing at a reasonable cost. Our team is here to allow you to focus on your research. We at Alesco work daily to create solutions and equipment for the scientific community, contributing to the advancement of Latin America biomedical research. Our mission is greater than just providing equipment. It is to provide security with a quality service and mainly with enormous respect and attention. For this reason, we invest in high technology and seek to maintain long-lasting relationships. Our commitment is to be a reliable partner that understands the needs, the reality, and the conditions of each customer to always offer the best solution. 
We understand the benefits of scientific research for humanity, and this encourages us. If today we have a better quality of life, greater longevity. If we beat cancer or use a medicine for a headache, it is because the advance of biomedical research allows us to. We trust in the work of researchers, in science, and the scientific community. And we pride ourselves on doing our part. Just like you, we are passionate. Science is what moves us. Because for Alesco, research is for life. Welcome everyone to FST's presentation. We appreciate you taking the time today and look forward to helping you find the right tools for the right application and your endless discoveries and research. Find Science Tools has been in business for over 45 years, providing scientists, researchers, and other life science professionals with high quality surgical instruments, utilizing German steel and German craftsmanship with a secondary quality control inspection in our Heidelberg office. As we say, we only carry the best and offer a multitude of fine microsurgical instruments like spring scissors, forceps and rangers, but also a variety of options for wound closures and animal identification. In addition to our three FST offices, we have over 50 distributors worldwide. While the majority of the audience is based in the USA, please note that we can ship anywhere in the world and any products not listed in our physical catalog or online at findscience.com can be sourced as a special order and we will work with you to get you what you need. Before we start, for those who are unfamiliar with FST, let me go over our core values we hold ourselves to and strive to provide to our customers. Quality. Impeccable product quality is what differentiates FST from the others. Secondly, our customer support. We strive for 100% customer satisfaction. Lastly, our QC department in Germany upholds our manufacturers to the standards FST and our customers expect with every instrument.